Clive Palmer, Australian business magnate, is at it again. Yesterday morning, I was sent a bright yellow pamphlet in the mail from the United Australia Party, the one that you can see on your screens right now. I've gone ahead and added a picture of Clive Palmer with his classic thumbs up, just so that everyone knows who the pamphlet was from. I'll get into the contents of the pamphlet soon, but first, let's talk about populism. What is populism? Google defines it as a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel that their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups. On the surface, it seems like a fairly common sense approach. Ultimately, in our system of democracy, you need to be able to appeal to the ordinary person to get voted in. I don't think populism is anything new, but certainly of late, it's been going through somewhat of a resurgence. In recent years, populism has often been associated with right-wing politics, although it can and has been used by the left. The late Hugo Chavez, former president of Venezuela, is perhaps the most famous example. US President Donald Trump has used populism to appeal to all the dissatisfied voters in middle America. He famously said that he would drain the swamp, a phrase that alludes to the historical draining of swamps to keep mosquito populations at bay to combat malaria. He used it to indicate that he would fix up the problems plaguing the federal government, taking care of the mosquitoes and the parasites while he's at it. Anyway, it worked. He got voted in. In academic circles, there's a bit of a debate over what populism actually is. Is it a strategy? Is it an ideology? Is it a style or a way of speaking? However, most researchers tend to agree that populism is comprised of two core principles. One, it must claim to speak on behalf of the common people. And two, the common people must stand in defiance of an established elite. The left will typically use populism to highlight socio-economic issues, such as the divide between the rich elite and the poor working class. The right will often focus on socio-cultural issues, for example, issues with current immigration policy that allows thousands of immigrants into the country, resulting in crime and unemployment. The issues don't necessarily have to be true, they just have to be repeated. So why does populism get a bad name? If its goal is to help the masses, then how can that be bad for society? Well, in recent years, it has been used by the radical right to prey on people's fears of unrestricted immigration. Leaders preyed on the collective anxiety of their supporters by highlighting issues of violence and extremism in the immigrant population. They often turn to real-life examples of immigrants that have turned to a life of religious extremism and crime. Of course, they fail to mention that even regular citizens can do stupid things and turn to a life of crime as well, but that's beside the point. This is about stopping the boats or building a border wall. President Trump successfully called for a ban on travellers coming from a number of Muslim-majority countries. These countries include Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen. It caused a lot of outrage throughout the world, as well as in America itself. Mr. Trump has stated that the policy is needed to protect the country against attacks by Islamic militants. It should be noted that this anti-immigration rhetoric of the right has less to do with populism and more to do with their ideology. The second reason why populism gets a bad rap is that populists are typically seen as disruptive to the status quo. They see themselves as vastly different from the existing order and in turn push for many changes to the established political and social structures. They often promote a sense of crisis, regardless of whether there is any actual crisis or not, and state that they have the solution to that crisis. A recent example of a populist-created crisis is the one currently going on in America regarding illegal immigration stemming from the US-Mexico border. The crisis, in Trump's words, "...all Americans are hurt by uncontrolled illegal migration. We are out of space to hold them, and we have no way to promptly return them back home to their country." The solution. I would build a great wall, and nobody builds walls better than me, believe me, and I'll build them very inexpensively. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, and I'll have Mexico pay for that wall." He hasn't got his wall yet, but certainly his populist movement is gaining some traction. In a recent CNN poll, 72% of those who watched President Trump's State of the Union address approved of his ideas for immigration. 76% of them approved of the State of the Union Address in general. Of course, this was just a viewer poll and not a scientifically valid study. The results aren't necessarily reflective of the American population at large. 
Australian politician Clive Palmer, Federal Leader of the United Australia Party, has jumped on the populist bandwagon too. In the pamphlet that was sent to my house, he uses classic populist rhetoric. He makes a number of statements that speak on behalf of the average Australian and target the established elite. I'll read out a few quotes for you now. I must warn you all of the serious threat we face to the sovereignty and freedom of our nation by the failure of our elected leaders to protect and defend our country. Chinese Communist government control of Australian ports and airports are matters of national security and concerning for all Australians. The Western Australian government is favouring Chinese government interests over the rights of Australians and Australian national security. The government's role is to protect Australian people and put Australia first. Anything less is an act of treason. Stand up for your country as the Anzacs did and put Australia first. Join the United Australia Party and fight for Australia remaining a free and independent nation. Together we can achieve the extraordinary by putting Australia first. The current government are planning to sell off Australia to China, and ultimately will end up becoming the 35th Chinese province. We'll be forced to use chopsticks, eat dumplings, and speak Mandarin." Okay, he didn't write those last few, but you get the idea of populism. Play on people's anxieties and fears. Create a mentality of the common man versus the established elite. Use a foreign invader as a pretext for change. It's all so 1984 Orwellian that it's almost laughable. Leaders throughout history have used populism to sway the masses. I for one am not going to listen to this populist rhetoric, but instead will focus on issues that are actually hurting our society. Massive wealth inequality, degradation of the environment, government accountability and transparency, nuclear proliferation, an AI arms race, and so on. These are issues that are actually hurting people. Border walls and strong borders aren't going to protect people from the fallout of mass habitat and biodiversity loss, or the effects of wealth inequality. Although populism is defined as support for the concerns of ordinary people, modern-day populism is hidden in nuance. The populist leader need only make statements that sound like they will address the people's concerns. Building border walls and stopping the boats don't actually stop illegal immigration. Banning Muslims doesn't stop terrorism. Populist leaders simply use this rhetoric to benefit one person — themselves. If it gets them elected, then mission accomplished. Modern-day populism does not benefit the common man. It benefits the leader who was suave enough to convince the people that he had all the answers. Ironically, it's the elite who benefit the most. Populism is a paradox.